I'm going to try another shot at this. I've got, I found better notes. So the notes that I used for the previous video, um, over 15.1 and 15.2, I think just, uh, I think we can improve on that a little bit because this trick uh, tracks a little bit better with the, with the book. So um, just talking about uh, K, some of the things that we'll, we'll be able to do here, I'm going to um, just go through this. These are all just sort of, overview of what we're going to be covering, okay? So the concept of equilibrium in the first place. Um, equilibrium, again, most of the reactions that we have talked about so far in your chemistry experience have been reactions that go all the way uh, one direction, okay? And that's not usually true for most reactions. Usually there's some sort of uh, back and forth with reactions. Now there are some that pretty much go to completion, and that's just about it. Um, but a lot of reactions actually exist in this equilibrium, where they go forward and they go backwards. They're, they're reversible reactions, okay? Um, so an example of a reaction that's not so reversible is something like, uh, you know, CH4 plus O2, you know, CO2 plus H2O. Usually we just write that with a forward arrow because there's, um, I mean, if you think about the energy diagram for that, uh, basically it's going to look something like this. Right, so you've got this, it uh, starts up at a high potential energy, you give it just a little bit of a spark, just a little activation energy, and all of a sudden this thing is reacting, um, and then you end up with your products down here. Now, if you try to go backwards, I mean, there's a huge, huge energy barrier that you have to overcome to go back the other direction. So, <coughs> most of the time, this reaction is just going to go one way, all right? Uh, but... Like I said, there are a lot of reactions that are a little bit closer in terms of their, their energy. They might look a little bit more like, uh, I don't know, like this maybe, okay? So that, you know, going from one, <coughs> from reactants to products in this direction is, is not a whole lot different as far as the activation energy than it is to go backwards, okay? So this reaction can happen in both directions at the same time. And what happens eventually, if you start a reaction out, um, it's, it's usually going to go in one direction first, but then a over time, it's going to start going in both directions until it reaches the, the same rate, going forward and backwards, okay? So once a forward reaction and a reverse reaction are going at the same rate, then we say that the reaction is in equilibrium, okay? And it's going to look like there's no overall change happening. This is kind of like what we talked about in uh, earlier sections where you've got a saturated solution down at the bottom. So here's your solid down here. Okay, and you've got your water. Well, it looks like you've just got a pile of solid stuff sitting at the bottom of this container. What we know is really happening is that some of the solid at any given instant is dissolving into the solution, but at the same time, uh, some of the particles that are dissolved are precipitating out of the solution. And so they're happening at the same rate, so then you just see this, uh, this pile down at the bottom that looks like it's the same the whole time. But in chemistry, nothing's ever standing still uh, things are always moving, so that's kind of the idea. All right, so as the system approaches equilibrium, uh, forward and reverse reactions are occurring, okay? But one or the other might be rec uh, occurring at a, at a faster rate initially, okay? Now, eventually, once you reach equilibrium, they're going to be going at the same rate, okay? Um, <coughs> so notice there for a while on this reaction, um, the rate of the reverse reaction starts at zero um, because, um, you know, and, and this reaction is showing N2O4 in equilibrium with uh, 2NO2, okay? So you've got this reaction happening. Let's say you start with only this, okay? Well, the reaction's going to go pretty quickly this way at first, and it's not going to go at all this way at first because there is no NO2 to change back into N2O4. But as the N2O4 starts to react, that rate starts to slow down because there's less of it. The rate of the NO2 starts to speed up because there's more of it. And eventually, we reach equilibrium here, okay? <clears throat> so that's kind of the idea with, with equilibrium. And it all has to do with this reaction rate idea that we talked about in the last section. Um, once we have equilibrium, the amount of reactant, the overall amount of reactant and product remains constant. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to be equal, okay? The NO2 and the N2O4 might have different concentrations, okay? So, for example, here, um, 
<coughs> now, I want, to no I want you to notice the difference in the graphs here. This one had rate on the y-axis, okay? So now they're happening at the same rate. That's why they're equal. But if you look at this graph, now we're graphing concentration on the y-axis, and the concentrations are not the same. The NO2 is up here. The N2O4 is down here, okay? That doesn't mean we're not at equilibrium. It just means that uh, we have different amounts of the NO2 and the N2O4 when we get to equilibrium, and then the forward and reverse rates are happening at the same speed, so you end up with equal amounts. The amounts don't change at that point. Okay? All right. So since both forward and reverse reactions are being carried out, we usually write the double arrow. Usually you're going to see it like this, okay, where you write that sort of thing. Okay, I don't know why that's the way of doing it, but that's usually the way that it's done. Um, dynamic equilibrium, again, that's what I said. In, in chemistry, it's always going to be a dynamic equilibrium, okay? Um, because everything's still moving, but the rates of forward and reverse are equal, okay? How fast you get to equilibrium depends on kinetics, all right? So um, the rate of the reaction um, in, in some ways affects the equilibrium. It affects how fast you get to equilibrium, but it doesn't affect the equilibrium constant, which we haven't talked about equilibrium constant yet, but we're about to, okay? So the idea of an equilibrium constant. <coughs> for a forward reaction, N2O4 going to 2NO2, we could write a rate law for that. We learned how to do that in the last unit, okay? So you've got your rate equals K, which is your rate constant, times the concentration of the N2O4. All right? Um, now that is the, again, that's the rate law for the forward reaction, but we know, because we've already looked at this reaction in this unit, there's a re reverse reaction that goes with this as well, where the NO2 is changing back into N2O4. So writing the rate law for that one, the rate is equal to K reverse uh, times the NO2 squared. All right? Now, <clears throat> what we have to remember here, this is really important, at equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate, okay? So, looking back at the equations we just wrote on the last slide here, um, so the forward rate is equal to Kf times N204. The reverse rate is equal to Kr times NO2 squared. So, if the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal to each other, then we can basically, um, we can set these equal to one another, right? Because these are both equal to the rates, and the rates are equal to one another, then, then those two are also equal. We can rewrite that, <coughs> and we end up with this expression right here. All right? So, why does that help us? Well, the reason it helps us is because these right here, these two are both constants, all right? These are rate constants. So, we can actually um, consider that to be one big constant because, you, you know, multiply two constants together, you still get a constant. Well, divide two constants by one another, you still get a constant. So, we're going to call that constant big K, all right? And big K, we're going to call the equilibrium constant. Um, now, the ratio of the rate constants is constant at that temperature, because remember, at a specific temperature, these numbers, the rate constants never change. The only thing that's going to change a rate constant is the temperature, right? So, they stay constant at that temperature, and so we end up with the expression KEQ, which just means equilibrium constant, is equal to NO2 squared over N2O4, okay? <coughs> so, at equilibrium, concentrations of reactants and products don't change with time. For equilibrium to occur, the reactants and the products, neither one of them can escape from the system, okay? Um, otherwise, you know, if you've got a gas going away, it's going to be hard to, for that to come back and react because it's you know, floating off into the atmosphere at that point. Um, at equilibrium, you've got a particular ratio of concentration uh, terms, okay? And it's going to equal a constant value. As long as you're at the same temperature, then that uh, equilibrium constant will stay the same no matter what your concentration values are, okay? All right, so here's how we basically write an equilibrium expression. This is actually pretty easy, okay? Um, you might have noticed, let me come back here for a second, looking at this reaction, N2O4 going to 2NO2, all right, and then again backwards, 2NO2 going to N2O4. Um, 
really what we what we have here in 204 and equilibrium with 2 in 2 Okay, you can relate this right here to this equilibrium expression that we wrote. And what we basically did was we put products, the concentration of the products, over the concentration of the reactants, okay? And this 2 right here actually does correspond to the squared value in the equilibrium expression. Now, I know that's really confusing because in the last unit, I told you you couldn't use stoichiometry um, to write your rate law, okay? Well, you can use stoichiometry to write your equilibrium expression. So you've got to differentiate between those two, between the rate law and the equilibrium expression, that you can use stoichiometry, the coefficient in a balanced chemical equation, to write your equilibrium expression. All right? So let's get over here. So basically, if you look at this general expression here, we put products, E and D, concentration of C times the concentration of D, raised to whatever the power of whatever your coefficient is in front of C or D, okay? Divided by the reactants. And that's basically how we write an equilibrium expression, okay? It works that way every time. Um, now, pressure is proportional to concentration for gases in a closed system because in a closed system, volume is not changing. Okay, so at that point, we can also write it in terms of pressure. Um, so the pressure of C, you know, to whatever power you had in the equation, times the pressure of D over the pressure of A times the pressure of B. Okay, so we can use partial pressures or concentrations. Now notice, for the concentrations, this is a Kc. For the pressures, this is a Kp. All right? So either way is an acceptable way of writing an equilibrium expression. Um, so KEQ versus KC versus KP. This can be a little confusing sometimes. KEQ is just the general, this is the equilibrium constant, okay? Um, KC is equal to KEQ uh, when molar concentrations are used to evaluate the constant, okay? Um, so, and this will be, this will be often, actually. Now, not as much in this unit, but especially when we get into acids and bases and solubility. Um, Kc is basically going to equal Keq, all right? Um, Kc is going to include Ka, Kb, weak acids, weak bases, uh, Ksp, solubility product, Kw, okay? Um, Kp is equal to Keq when P stands for pressure, okay? Um, so there are just basically, there are different situations where you would use each of these, okay? Kc we use when we're thinking about it in terms of concentration. Kp is what we use when we're thinking about the reaction in terms of partial pressures, all right? So you just have to pay attention to what you're using in the equation. Now, there actually is a way to relate Kc and Kp to one another, all right? So you use PV equals nRT. If you rearrange this, um, you can solve for pressure here, okay? Pressure equals N over V times RT. Um, N over V is actually the same thing as molarity, right? Um, so this right here can become concentration. That's really confusing because usually in the gas law equations, big M stands for molar mass. But in this case, it stands for molarity, okay? So you've got uh, pressure equal to molarity times the R value times the temperature, all right? Um, and so if you plug that into the Kp expression for each of the substances, uh, what you're going to end up with here is this equation. Now, I don't think you're going to need to know this equation for the AP exam. I'm going to mention it because you, know, you never know. Um, but I, I really think that they would uh, maybe want you to understand Kc and Kp are a little bit different, but I don't think they're going to actually ask you to mathematically solve for Kc when they give you a Kp, all right? But just in case, this is how you would do it, okay? If you want to find the Kp and you've been given the Kc, then you just take that Kc value times the R times whatever temperature the reaction happens at times delta N. Okay, now delta N, you just look at the equation, the reaction that they give you, and you take the moles of gas products minus the moles of gas reactants, and that would give you your delta N. So that's how you would go from Kp to, uh, or from Kc to Kp. All right? Um, Write the equilibrium expressions for these reactions. This is the kind of thing you're going to see here. Um, now, 
the trick on these is knowing whether to use KC or KP. Now, on this first one, these are all gases, right? So on this one, I would actually probably write it in terms of KP. Um, so you've got your pressure of O2. And I usually put these things in parentheses just to make it a little bit cleaner. But we raise that to the third power because there's a, a coefficient 3 in front, divided by um, oops, sorry, pressure of the O3 to the second power squared because of the coefficient 2. Okay, so products over reactants, and then we just do um, whatever we need to based on the stoichiometry, either squared or cubit or whatever. All right? And I wrote that one again in terms of P because these are all gases. So the second one would be the same way. All right, KP on this one. Um, my product is NOCl, so pressure of NOCl uh, squared over, and then I've got two reactants this time, so I just multiply those together. So we've got the pressure of NO squared times the pressure of Cl2. And that one's just the first power because there's no coefficient from it. All right, so that's your equilibrium expression for that one. The last one here, um, kind of tricky because it's got aqueous and gas in it. You know, I'm actually going to hold off on that one because um, I want to wait until we've talked about heterogeneous equilibria first. Okay, so don't worry about that one for now. I won't give you one like that yet. Um, more equilibrium expressions. Here, let me show you B on this one, because this one, they're all aqueous. So if they're all aqueous, it makes sense to do it in terms of concentration. So we'd write this one as KC. Um, again, product is on the top, so CDBR for uh, 2 minus. So CDBR for 2 minus, concentration of that, over the concentration of our two reactants. Uh, which is CD2 plus times BR minus to the fourth power because there's a coefficient of 4 in the front. All right? So there's your equilibrium expression for that one. Okay. Uh, it's important to understand that equilibrium can be reached from either direction. Um, so in other words, you can, uh, you can start with just... Um, Well, okay, this is just showing it in terms of NO2. I have a different graph here. Let's see. So, uh, actually, maybe if you look at the chart, this is showing the initial N2O4 and the initial NO2. Okay. So, in the first experiment, you don't have any of the N2O4 to start with. So, obviously, um, <coughs> the reaction is going to start by NO2 forming N2O4 because there is no N2O4 to change into NO2 at first. Okay, so the reaction is going to go in that way. By the time we get down to the bottom one, now we've got just N2O4 and none of the NO2, so the reaction would happen this way. Okay, but given the same temperature, we're going to end up with the same uh, equilibrium constant every time. Okay, um, so, and, and notice this is kind of showing the same basic thing here. Okay, it doesn't matter what we start with. So in the first reaction here, we started with uh, a good amount of H2, uh, some N2, and none of the NH3. Okay? And here are the levels they eventually all reach. Okay? Look on the second graph, this time we started with uh, more of the NH3 and none of the uh, H2 or the N2. But by the end, we've got the same thing. Again, assuming that these are happening at the same temperature. Okay, um, so we're going to have end up with the same proportions of all three substances at equilibrium, which means we're going to end up with the same equilibrium constant. The only thing that changes the value of the equilibrium constant is the temperature. Okay. Um, this one's asking to go from KC to KP. I think I'm going to skip over that because, again, I don't think that you need to know how to calculate that. And then this is another one where they're going from K in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, equilibrium constants in units. So this is good to talk about quickly. Okay, um, equilibrium constants are described using activities rather than concentrations or pressures. Okay, that means there are no units. Now, so again, this is really 
challenging because in the last unit we learned about these rate constants, little k, and the rate constants, I told you, it's very, very, very important what the units are. Okay? Well, with an equilibrium constant, big K, forget about units. There are none. All right? So if you put units on big K, you get it wrong. If you don't put units on little k, you get it wrong. Okay? So you've got to just make sure and keep that straight. When you're working with rate, reaction rate, and you're using little k, a rate constant, you need to include your units. Okay? With uh, big K, equilibrium constant, there are no units. All right? Um, I'm not going to go too much into the activity thing, okay? But the activity in an ideal mixture, the concentration is relative to one molar. That's our reference concentration. And the pressure is relative to one atmosphere. So essentially what happens with all of these, let's say you have a 0.2 molar concentration. Um, I guess let's just use the reaction we've been using here. Okay, so let's say that I have a um, 0.2 molar concentration of this and a 0.3 molar concentration of this. Okay, oops, there's supposed to be two there. So when I write the equilibrium expression for this, I'm actually going to plug in numbers for this one, and maybe I write it in terms of concentration because that's what I know here. Um, really what I'm doing, is before I plug it into the equilibrium expression, I'm dividing both of these by reference concentration, which is one molar. Okay. I don't worry too much about why they do this, but when they do this, the molarities cancel out, so you end up with something called an activity, which is just a number. Okay? Same thing with pressure. So that's why K doesn't have any units. So don't stress out too much about that. Just remember K, big K, equilibrium constant has no units. Okay? Oh, there's actually an example that they show here. Um, for pure substances, solids or liquids, the reference concentration is itself. Okay, it's just one. Um, all right, so that's as far as we need to go for this one. Um, so I will see you guys next time. Hopefully that helps a little better than the former video that I made. Sorry.